All right, so good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from across the continent. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. If you're joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And I want to say a huge thank you to all our teachers live and on YouTube for continuing to join us in these really odd times as we continue to showcase amazing people and organizations around the globe. Now, one of our favorite organizations here at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants is the Duke Lemur Center. We've partnered with them on 30 plus programs over the last year and a bit, highlighting pretty much everything you can imagine imagine to do with Madagascar, with lemurs, and some of the conservation efforts that happen there. So I'm particularly pleased today to welcome in Dr. James Herrera. So he is the lead on their SAVA conservation program. So today he's going to talk about protecting lemurs during a crisis. COVID-19 has affected us all in a, a wide variety of ways, but it is in particular affecting uh, the Madagascar in general. It's a very poor country to begin with, and it's only exacerbated a lot of the issues there. So we're going to learn about a research expedition he went on, some of the amazing work that Malagasy scientists do in conjunction with the Duke Lemur Center team, and what's happening right now in country. So without further ado, thank you so much for joining us, James, and take us away. It's my pleasure, Jesse. Hi, everybody. It's always a pleasure to be on Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, and it's been a while, so I'm really excited to speak with you. Happy New Year to everyone. And this is especially timely because um, I'm going to be reporting on the results of a research mission that just finished um, at the end of the year. It's a team of Malagasy scientists who have been leading the, at the forefront of lemur conservation and uh, really helping to protect those lemurs during this crisis. Um, COVID-19 is, is crippling the, the world and luckily in Madagascar, the disease burden hasn't been very high. But unfortunately, because of the country being completely shut down, the economic crisis is uh, really uh, hurting the, the whole country. So it's, a, it's an important time to be doing this kind of conservation work as people are struggling to, uh, you know, to, to get through their day-to-day -day lives. So I'm going to start with just a very uh, broad overview, remind us all where Madagascar is. It's this little island off the southeast coast of Africa that's actually not so little. It's the fourth largest uh, island in the world. Here you can see um, I've made the green, which is the forest cover uh, across the island, and all those areas that are considered non-forest is, is in white. And uh, I'm going to focus especially on the northeastern part of the country, which is called the Sava region. It's an acronym, S-A-V-A, -A, for the four different districts in the area. And we're going to be focusing on lemurs, which, uh, of course, is my favorite group. And this is one of my favorite lemurs, the silky shifaka. It's extremely rare. It's only found in the Sava region. And even in the most pristine rainforests, they would be very difficult to find, very rare. We think that there's probably no more than two or 300 of these animals left in the wild, and they are considered critically endangered. So this was the focus of uh, the research that I'll tell you about. This is the habitat where the silky shifak lives. These are the rainforests of Maro Jeji National Park. Um, it is a montane rainforest, which means up there in the mountains, as you can see, it's super steep and all, all these, you know, uh, rocky cliffs just covered in jungle. And in all that jungle, there are the native lemurs. So I'm going to start by giving you a little bit of a background about what are lemurs. And then we'll talk about the Malagasy scientists who are studying them and protecting them. And then we'll talk a little bit about the conservation action planning that these Malagasy scientists are implementing to protect the lemurs. So what are lemurs? They are the primates that are native to Madagascar. So they're primates like monkeys, apes, and people, but they're unique in that they are only found in Madagascar. And because of that isolation, they're a very um, special group that have characteristics that are very different from other monkeys and apes. Um, there's about a hundred different species and they range in size from the smallest mouse lemurs, about 30 grams, to the largest living lemur, which is the injury, about the size of a medium-sized dog. Uh, the smaller species tend to be nocturnal, meaning they're out at night and they're foraging for insects. Um, they eat the nectar from flowers and eat small, small uh, fruits. But there are also a lot of lemurs that mysteriously eat uh, only leaves, even very small species. And uh, that's, that's very unique to lemurs uh, and only a handful of other mammals because when, they're your, when you're that small, you need to eat a lot of leaves to find enough nutrition. Some of them even uh, specialize on just bamboo, like the, this bamboo lemur here and here. 
Uh, so they're kind of like mini pandas. And then the, the day active lemurs that we see over on this side, they tend to be much larger and incorporate more fruit into their diet. So how did lemurs get to Madagascar? Well, our best guess is they rafted. Uh, just like the other mammals, uh, somehow, you know, maybe on floating bits of vegetation that get blown out with storms, the lemurs uh, dispersed to Madagascar. And we think this is probably true because Madagascar has been an isolated island for at least 100 million years, long before most of these mammals were uh, even evolving. So given the time periods that we think you know, for their, their evolution, they must have, uh, you know, rafted over. And when they, uh, <coughs> excuse me, when they arrived in Madagascar, they found, uh, found a, a wide diversity of habitats. So the eastern part of the island is covered in lush rainforests, while uh, up in the higher elevation areas, there are these mountains where you find habitats that kind of look like the moors of England and Ireland. And um, on the western side of the island, there's much, much less rain. And so you get what's called a dry deciduous forest. All the trees actually lose their leaves in the dry season, not because it's cold, but because there's just not enough rain. And then in the far south, it gets so little rainfall that it borders on a desert. And these plants that you see that kind of look like cactuses actually are not cactuses at all. They're uh, unique groups of plants that are only found in Madagascar that have independently come up with these similar cactus-like forms, you know, with the spines and tiny leaves and things. So many of the lemurs play a really function, uh, a fundamental functional role in the ecosystem. And that's because they do stuff like this, eating fruits. When the, many of the lemurs eat the fruits, they actually swallow the seeds whole. And the seeds, as they pass through the digestive system of the lemur and they get pooped out, actually germinate better than if they were not eaten by a lemur. So the lemurs are kind of like the farmers of the forest. They're uh, crucial to the natural regeneration of the forest. And many of the trees that people rely on, for example, uh, to build their homes are actually dispersed by lemurs. So without those lemurs, the forest may not be able to recover. So I want to just take a, a brief pause and ask you all what, what you know about lemurs and maybe if you have a favorite kind of lemur. Uh, I want to kind of gauge the room to see, you know, what you all think of if you've ever heard of lemurs or maybe this is the first time you've ever heard of them. So one thing we can do when you ask questions like that is that if anyone in the chat bar wants to share in any comments, uh, if our live groups, I know we've got a lot of teachers without their kids actually in a classroom, so you can share with me in the chat bar on the right of your screen. So people do answer those sort of questions, I'll absolutely pass on their answers to you, James, okay? Great. Perfect. Yeah, you can always feel free to, to stop me at any point um, and let me know if you've got any thoughts like that. So to, to pick up again, uh, where we left off, um, I'm going to tell you now about uh, some of the risks for lemurs. So unfortunately, lemurs are considered one of the most endangered groups of mammals. And by endangered, I'm talking about the IUCN or the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. Uh, it's this organization that brings together specialists on all these different animals to determine if the species should be considered critically endangered, endangered, or maybe it's not even threatened. Uh, and, you know, the more research that is done, the more we're finding that, yes, most lemur species are considered threatened. In fact, 90, more than 90% are threatened. And what is it that's threatening these lemurs? Well, the number one thing is habitat loss. So here are maps again of, of Madagascar and red is the Saba region up here in the north. And what I'm showing here in the green is the forest cover from 1950. So this is based on um, aerial photographs, people going over in airplanes taking photos, and this is the extent of the forest cover back in 1950. I'm going to highlight this spot here um, where that star just came up, and I want you to keep an eye on that as we uh, move forward through time. So Madagascar was a French colony, and in 1950s this was um, you know, really kind of at the peak, uh, or almost towards the end of, of uh, the colonial era. And there was a lot of uh, expansion of agriculture at that time, especially for uh, export crops like uh, vanilla actually comes originally from Mexico, but most of the world's vanilla is grown in Madagascar and in the Sava region of Madagascar. Coffee, 
Uh, chocolate actually comes from trees, uh, and Madagascar was a big exporter of chocolate, um, and many other um, raw materials like that, as well as uh, timber and wood. So the uh, French were um, creating railroad systems in Madagascar, and so they needed a lot of wood to fuel those railroads, as well as uh, export to Europe. And so from 1950 until 1970, we could already see uh, a pretty big contraction in the amount of forest. Now in 1960, Madagascar won their independence, and they experienced a lot of political and economic turmoil in those uh, early decades. And so from 1970 to 1990, we saw an even more dramatic decline in forest cover until what we see today or you know, more recently. And in fact, just since the year 2000, more than 20% of the forest cover in the Sava region was lost. So, you know, what is this really, what is the cause of this deforestation? What does it really look like on the ground? Well, it's usually due to what we call swidden or shifting agriculture. And so this is where the farmers will cut a patch of vegetation. Uh, it might just be grass or, or bushes, but, it, you know, for people that live near the forest, they'll often cut parcels of forest. They let all that vegetation dry and then they will burn it. And by burning it, it clears all that debris, but it also releases a lot of ash, which is actually good for the soil in the short term. And so the farmers can grow their staple crops like rice, as well as corn, cassava, and things like that. But usually, uh, the, because of the system, the soil erodes very quickly. So every time it rains, soil is just washed away, and um, there's, there's no real roots or trees left to hold that soil together. So usually the farming is only good for about a year or two, and then the farmers need to move to a new area and try to let that old area you know, regenerate. Another big um, issue for lemurs is hunting. So in parts of Madagascar, uh, hunting lemurs is actually taboo and, uh, you know, nationally it is illegal. But in many parts of Madagascar, it is not taboo and it is a fundamental part of uh, the human livelihood. Uh, it's a really important part of their diet. So we'll talk about that in just a moment. And also, um, you know, illegal, um, illegally catching animals and selling them in the pet trade is a growing problem. So a lot of tourist venues like hotels or restaurants want to be able to attract tourists with a, a, you know, a pet lemur. And this is a, a growing issue. So here we're going to focus in again on the Sava region. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the protected areas. So first, there's Marjeji National Park. Then there is a site called the Anzanahari Bay Sud Special Reserve. And connecting the two is an area known as the Komatsa, which stands for the corridor protecting them. And connecting them. And this is corridors in general are really important uh, links that preserve the connectivity between these uh, patches. Because if you imagine, if that patch of forest was cut, Marojeji would end up being kind of like a little island. So it's a really important area to conserve. And um, just starting last year, the Duke Lemur Center has engaged with the WWF and with the university in the Saba region called Cursa to conduct lemur conservation research and action planning. So here are some of the CURSA staff and teachers on their first expedition, and this was back in um, September and October, where we have uh, Ardeel, Edgar, and Anise leading one mission, and then we also had uh, separate missions that were mostly led also by students. So here's Romeo and Jean Juo, who are now master's students at another university in Diego. We're very proud for them as well as local uh, research uh, assistants and, and you know, specialized lemur trackers like Nestor, who's been working with the Marjeji uh, research teams for uh, several decades already. Here's uh, the team just as they finished their most recent mission in December. Actually, the team was so motivated and so hardworking, they chose to work through Christmas. <laughs> Even when I told them that they should come home and be there with their families, they insisted they wanted to stay and get more data, so they worked on Christmas. <laughs> And uh, here's in the in the foreground is Edgar, Eric, um, uh, Telesi, and Suzanne, and some are doing their masters, others doing their PhDs. And in the background are some of the local researchers and forest managers. So they got to see some really pristine rainforests. I wish I could have been there with them. It's actually been my dream to visit these sites, and just uh, stunning uh, tree diversity with these massive uh, primary forest trees. 
And they did in fact spot the silky shavakas. They only found two groups, unfortunately, even though they were out there uh, hiking through the forest for many hours every day for three weeks, they only found these two groups. And I'll point out here too, that the silky shavaka is very unique in that they have this um, skin pigmentation that some individuals have this sort of white or pinkish face while others have a, a darker face. And it, it really gives them a, a unique look. Some of them kind of look like uh, ghosts up there in the trees. And the, these lemurs are uh, some of the biggest species that are still alive in Madagascar. They live in family groups with usually two or three females and one to three males, and then their offspring. And they spend a lot of time uh, socializing. They play, they groom each other. And sometimes it really just looks like they're cuddling and nuzzling and kissing each other, but they don't spend a lot of time being social. The team also found uh, 10 other species of lemurs. So these included the white-fronted brown lemur. Uh, this is a, one of the uh, species that's native to the region. And in this species, you have the males have the white hair and females have black hair. Now this group uh, is, was expected, that we, should, we expected to find this lemur species here, but we were very surprised when the team reported that they found uh, the uh, common brown lemur, which is a closely related species, but it's actually quite different. And it's not known to occur in this region. In fact, the closest other locality is over hundred kilometers away. So it was very, very surprising. And the research team is now keen to ask new questions about you know, the ecology of these species, how they're able to coexist. Here are some of those bamboo lemurs that I was mentioning, that they eat enough, bam enough cyanide in the bamboo to kill a human being, and yet they are not phased by it at all. Um, this is one thing that helps them to persist because they can live in kind of small degraded areas because the bamboo is quite abundant in those habitats. The team also did a lot of nocturnal surveys. So they were out uh, hiking through the forest at night, searching for these lemurs. And this is a, one picture of a species called the sportive lemur, which is a little hard to see. I mean, when they're up in the trees at night, it's uh, so hard to get a, a photo of them. But they also sleep during the day using hollows in trees. And so if you're lucky and you can find these sleeping sites, you might catch a glimpse of them during the day as they poke their head out to keep an eye on what's going on around them. There's also the dwarf lemur, which is about the size of a squirrel and um, you know, runs around through the trees at night. Uh, it's always amazing to see how agile they are in complete darkness. There's the mouse lemur, of course, and here's just a, a short clip to show you a little bit about, you know, how they, their behavior and how they uh, look in the wild. And then we're really excited, but we're still uncertain because we got this photo and the team observed this animal several times during their mission. But again, it's pitch black and you know just barely using a little bit of light from their flashlights um, and some of these animals can be very far away so picture is not great but we are hopeful that it is this species which is the hairy eared dwarf lemur so it's unique from the mouse lemur because if you look at his little ears they're all fluffy and in the mouse lemurs and dwarf lemurs the hairs are the ears are naked so this species has been recorded from nearby locations but not in the Komatsa itself, as far as we know, and it is also another rare species uh, that, that we want to learn more about. So as fascinating as all those results were from the forest, the team also learned a lot about the threats to lemurs, and these were primarily in terms of hunting, clear-cutting, and agriculture. So not only did uh, the team have a group of ecologists working in the forest, but also a team of social scientists conducting focus groups and what we call a participatory rural, rural appraisal to understand how people use the natural resources around them. And you know, what, what we're learning more and more from research like this is that hunting is not only a conservation issue, it's a human health issue. So hunting is one of the fundamental ways for people to obtain high nutrient and especially high protein foods. And so for people that live in Madagascar, you know, there's about 26 million people. 80% of them are living in the uh, rural countryside and 70% are living below the poverty line. So these factors, which are socioeconomic, are coupled with uh, health issues. So for example, 48% of people in Madagascar are considered underweight. 
And uh, women, especially women of reproductive age, suffer very high rates of anemia. And anemia is a, is a nutritional disease where there's not enough iron in the blood to help uh, keep oxygen in the blood. And so it, it leads to fatigue and weakness and a lot of other health complications. And it's especially difficult for infant development. So Madagascar, as I said, this is during an economic crisis right now. So this is a graph from the World Bank uh, talking about GDP, which is gross domestic product. It's a kind of a measure that economists use to say something about the, the economy of a government or of a, of a nation. And so here on the y-axis, they're talking about the percent, you know, so we can look at change over time. So whenever it's below this line, it means it's a negative, it's a decrease in the, in the overall economics of the country. And so here we are in 2020, where they are currently experiencing an economic crisis, the likes of which they have not had in over 10 years. The last time was in 2009. And that one was when there was a huge political crisis, a coup d'etat, where there was literally a military government takeover. So, you know, the, the crisis that we're seeing now is on par with that. And it's going to take perhaps a decade to recover. So hunting, again, returning to this concept, uh, there's been a lot of research. This is what one of the snare traps looks like. It, the, the hunters will cut down some trees and make like a log bridge because the lemurs prefer to go through the trees. And then they put these snares, sometimes baited with banana, so the lemurs, as they're walking along the branch, will get caught in that snare. Now, as sad as that is, uh, there's been a lot of research to show just how crucial a wildlife meat is to these people who, who, who need it. Um, there's been research by some of my colleagues like Chris Golden and, and Courtney Borgerson who have shown that if, if people lose their access to that wild meat, either because um, you know, it's, there, it's illegal to hunt them and, and, you know, we're trying to protect them. Or if the lemurs go extinct and there are no lemurs left to hunt, it would significantly increase the rates of anemia in children in these communities that depend on it. So we can't just take away hunting entirely. And I think a lot of folks uh, in the U.S. can probably relate to that. And also we learned from the focus groups that lemurs are not really the main target. Uh, of hunting. There's actually a, a specific season where people do more hunting. And in general, we've seen this in other research as well, uh, as well as the information we got during this survey, you know, families typically will only hunt maybe one or two lemurs per year. Now that doesn't seem like so much, but multiply that by thousands upon thousands of households and it is a big threat, but it's an important aspect of their health. The real, um, you know, bushmeat target for the hunting is especially these guys, which are called tenrix. So tenrix are a unique group of mammals that are only found um, in Madagascar. Actually, I think there's a handful of species in Africa. I may be wrong. But on the top, we have the, uh, the common tenrix, and on the bottom, it's the hedgehog tenrix. They may look like hedgehogs, but they're not related at all. And these animals are hunted uh, fairly frequently. So they tend to be, you know, a fatty little um, animal kind of the, about the size of a rabbit and they burrow in the ground so hunters can find them and usually with dogs and uh, will dig them out of their burrows to eat. Now it's still an open question as to whether this is sustainable or not because tenrix actually reproduce very quickly like rabbits. In fact they can have like 20 pups in a litter more than most other mammals and they do seem to tolerate you know the degraded uh, areas outside of the forest. So it's not like they're, you know, only found in pristine habitats. Still, we need to consider what impact this hunting might have on the, the native species. And it's a question, especially for the local people, as to whether this is going to provide enough food in the future. So the farmers and the, and the people themselves, they tell us and they communicated to the research team that they want to find sustainable alternatives. Among them are chicken husbandry, but also aquaculture or fish farming. So fish farming is something that the Duke Lemur Center has been investing in for quite some time as a sustainable alternative to wildlife hunting. And here is one of the demonstration ponds uh, where uh, the DLC partners with a local school. And you can see the, the, um, the participants there are, are actually harvesting the fish that, they, that they've grown up in this pond. In just uh, you know, a few months, they were able to harvest 13 kilos of fish 
which were distributed among the participants. And they even sold some of the fish and used the, the funds they made to buy a new blackboard for the school. So it's not only a source of food, but also a potential source of income. I've talked uh, previously about agroecology, which is the fusion of agriculture and ecology to have like nature-based solutions to our agricultural challenges. Um, trees just provide so many benefits on the landscape. I, I don't even know where to start, but I like this figure because it illustrates a few of the key functions those trees play. So tree roots go deep, deep into the earth, much, much deeper than any of our crop plants do. And so they can pull up water, minerals, nutrients from very deep in the soil, which are inaccessible to other plants. And then they put those nutrients into their bodies, into their stems and, and branches and in their leaves. And so as those uh, leaves fall, we can recycle those products and turn them into mulch and compost and other things that will help to improve the fertility of the soil for our food crops like corn, cassava, beans, whatever. Uh, many of our very important crops actually need shade to grow, uh, uh, you know, the naturally. So, for example, cacao, which is where we get our, our chocolate, and coffee trees, they're naturally uh, growing in the understory of the forest, so they need shade. Then the trees also uh, attract beneficial biodiversity, and by that I mean it attracts the bees and the, and the butterflies that do the pollinating. It attracts the uh, hawks and owls that eat the rat pests or the other birds that might eat the insect pests. And so, you know, it's really important to have these trees on the landscape. And that's one of the things that um, where the DLC is actively um, partnering with different organizations and different communities to put trees back on the landscape. So here is one of the nurseries uh, uh, with a partner a community where they're growing fruit trees like avocados here in the front, as well as the cacao, the, co the chocolate trees, native trees. And there were um, providing training opportunities to understand how these trees can be incorporated into the agricultural landscape. And so we've got students who are working closely with the farmers to help them develop the capacity to, um, to do what's called agroforestry. It's a mix of planting trees and doing your agriculture. So, so far over 2000 seedlings uh, were distributed just this last year to 30 participants as they go and plant them in their farms. And we're also uh, creating training opportunities through the university to train farmers in organic and sustainable farming practices. So here is just a, a brief clip showing how uh, the training includes amending or improving the soils using locally available materials like ash from the cooking fire rather than burning uh, the vegetation. And these green leaves that they're mixing in there have lots of nitrogen. This is also an opportunity for local folks and the neighbors and kids to see their community members uh, farming and gardening using new techniques. So and we're seeing like really great results so far. About 150 farmers have participated and we do uh, monthly evaluations and almost 50% of the people have created their own home gardens and, and used these techniques in their farms. So this is just one example of a, a bean garden and just a small unused corner of one of the participants' yards. This is uh, Dosseline. And here she's exhibiting how, you know, they have a daily harvest of beans from that garden. This plant also attracts one of my favorite insects, the lantern bug, which uh, my uh, colleague, uh, Courtney Borgerson, has been doing research on these to show how nutritious they are. Yes, these insects are actually edible and they are delicious. They taste like bacon and eggs and they provide just as much protein, actually I think more protein and iron than uh, a comparable amount of beef, chicken, fish. So this is a, another alternative that I really, uh, we're looking to develop in the future. So if I'm to summarize, you know, our overall goal is lemur conservation as well as sustainable development. And these are not mutually exclusive, these go hand in hand. And to achieve those goals, we have a number of activities that include the research, both ecological and sociological, anthropological that I was talking about, as well as training and development uh, for local resource management techniques. And these all require inputs. So, you know, the, one of the most important inputs is the participation and the partnership 
with those local actors. Uh, we can't do any of this work without the uh, engagement of the community. And this is especially true in some of these areas where the research team is working now because there has been no tourism to date. There's been almost no research in some of these places. So people are a little wary when uh, our, our teams show up and they worry that, you know, are they gonna come and take our land away or uh, report us if we're doing any kind of illegal activities. But we have to forge these relationships with people first and develop that trust. And the Duke Lemur Center has been doing that in Saba region for over 10 years. So we, uh, we've got some experience in that. And of course it takes sponsorship to initiate. So we're writing grants now and seeking donations to keep this research going because uh, we wanna be able to have a long-term presence in these research areas. So like I said, the next steps are to continue to engage those stakeholders and to conduct more Lima research. And uh, we're in the initial planning phases where we're co-creating these action plans with the communities. It's what we call a place-based approach. So each community may have different needs and they may have different visions for um, their sustainability. So we're trying to understand and, and come to uh, um, you know, the collective action together. And we have to strategize these activities to make sure that we're really trying to address both the main drivers of all these issues, as well as having the positive outcomes that we hope for. So with that, I have to acknowledge and thank um, the, the other DLC Saba staff, which is uh, Charlie Welsh, who's the conservation coordinator and been working with DLC for over 30 years, and Lantu Anji Ananjasana, who is our project manager, our project coordinator on the ground. Um, he's been running the ship for the last year pretty much on his own because I've been stuck here in the U.S. because of COVID, so we're really grateful for all his work. Of course, this is the work of this amazing team, uh, and I feel like I'm very privileged to be able to share their story with you. Uh, but I, I, I really want to acknowledge all their hard work. And of course, the, um, the, the different uh, sponsors that have made this uh, work possible. So with that, I'll pause and take any questions you might have. Well, James, thank you so, so much for, again, such a fantastic presentation. There really is no other group doing such um, embedded work within communities to achieve all sorts of amazing conservation ends like the Duke Lemur Center. So it's always a pleasure and a privilege to get to highlight these amazing stories. So thank you so, so much for joining us today. We've got stories from across the continent. So we've got Alberta, Maine, Ontario, California, Florida, Alabama, uh, and more. So we're literally going coast to coast across the continent. Thank you to all our over 250 kids beginning today. We really appreciate wow. being here. Um, so we're going to start with some live questions from our, our live classes. Uh, this is like the all-star lineup of teachers, some of the most engaged and excited uh, educators we have uh, across the continent are with us today. So it's exciting to have them all in. And we're going to start with this fall first class in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Come on in, guys, and go for it. Yeah. <laughs> in the maybe not a gas car, the lemurs were attacked by fusas. Are they a real threat to lemurs? Yeah. <laughs> the fusa, yeah. Uh, I, I I was always upset with the Madagascar movie because they made the fusa look like some kind of crazy hyena, mm -hmm. and it's really a beautiful animal. Yes, the the, the, um, the spelling is always a, a little tricky, um, but it's a it's an amazing animal that. It looks like a cross between a cat and a dog, but it's actually its own unique uh, brand of carnivore. And there's a natural balance. You know, the, the, the FUSA definitely hunt the lemurs and they can do a, a serious number uh, on the populations. I mean, I have some colleagues that, you know, when we were doing our research together, they had like an entire group of their lemurs that got eaten by the FUSA and they had to start their research all over because they had to find new lemurs. So, so it can be, um, it can be, you know, locally impactful, but again, it's a natural balance between predators and prey. So, you know, if there are, if it's an kind of like a pristine situation, probably no, there's a balance, but the problem becomes as that balance gets thrown off, like with human activities, now we may have fewer lemurs because of the loss of habitat. That means less prey for the FUSA. And so, you know, we, it's a, it's a, it's a very deep question. <laughs> yeah. Um, very, very cool to start us off, guys. And I'd encourage all our classes to look up the FUSA when you're done. It's like a turbo tree weasel. It's very, very cool, a fantastic and unique looking animal. So I'd encourage you to check that out. All right, let's go to Mr. Lavogue's class, joining us in North Palm Beach in Florida. Again, all these nice, warm destinations. Uh, uh, for someone up here in Toronto, it's, I'm very jealous. But Mr. Lavogue, come on in. <laughs> no, thanks for having us. Um, we have our, our third graders have lots of questions. So I'm going to try to combine a couple together. 
Um, Zach wanted to know about the speed and Drew wants to know about the size. So uh, roughly what is like the uh, average speed and top speed of a lemur and how big is the lemur species? And, and if you could answer both questions in like feet and pounds for our American students. Yeah. You know, I'm going to have to go back and do my own research on the speed. Uh, there is, you know, research out there. I know a lot of it was done right here at Duke Lemur Center because they people would like set up cameras and stuff that they could, you know, really high quality sensitive cameras where they can actually like, you know, gauge not only the speed, but also the forces that the animals use. I don't have the answer for you off the top of my head, unfortunately, but in terms of sizes. So yeah, the biggest lemur is, um, it's 10 kilos. So it's not, and it's actually a little less than 10. So it's about 20 pounds. Um, but the smallest lemur, the mouse lemur is about an ounce. So it's not even, you know, it's like way less than a pound. It fits in the palm of your hand. But I will actually do some digging to find out about, you know, the top speeds. Those Shafaka, I mean, I should have shown a movie a movie of how they move. Yeah. Check them out afterwards. I see in the chat somebody mentioned they're the ones that are famous for like hopping on two legs across the ground. They are amazing to see in the forest. Check out some of the other DLC videos too because they'll take you out to the natural uh, enclosures and you can see them move. And they just pogo stick through the forest. I mean, it, you know, no. if I were guessing off the top of my head, more, you know, more than five miles per hour, because I have to run to catch up with them. <laughs> it's one of the coolest things in nature to watch a fagas jump between trees. So I, again, uh, S-I-F-A-K-A, -A, check that out when you're done. There's a ton of YouTube videos of them on the ground and in the trees, uh, a really nice follow up to this presentation. All right, let's go to Ms. Ayers class joining us in Toronto. If you guys have a question for us, come on up. Hi, Jesse and James. Thank you so much for joining us. We're virtual due to COVID, but we brainstorm together. And we have a lot of questions, but the first one on our list is, how many lemurs, lemurs would you estimate are in Madagascar? Do you mean in terms of number of species or number of animals total? Number of lemurs total. Yeah, so the there are about 100 different species but for each species, it really varies. So some of them are super rare, like the silky shavaka that I mentioned that we think there may be only 200 or 300 total. Um, but then there's others like the white fronted brown lemur that in my own research, I've actually estimated there may be hundreds of thousands of them. And that's because it's a common species. They use a lot of different kinds of habitats and, and their habitat is still pretty, pretty expansive. Some of them, even the mouse lemurs that we were talking about, there's probably more than a million because these animals can live in even like, you know, with no trees left, they'll survive in the bushes and um, they can live at like, you know, a hundred individuals in one hectare or two hectare, not even one hectare. So some of the lemurs, there are a lot, probably in, on the order of millions. And, and this is all debatable. I know that, um, you know, my research is a little bit contentious because some of the animals like the ringtail lemurs, I estimated there's probably a couple thousand, but other research has suggested there may be far fewer. So, you know, it's it's a it's an active area of research and I wish I had the answer because that's that's really what we need to know for their conservation. But it's a great question and highlighting that there's uncertainty in science and highlighting that it's a, a very much in process activity is something that I think is very important for students to hear. So I'm, I'm glad we got that question. I love the whiteboard, uh, Ms. Sarah. Where to go? Uh, nice prep. All right, let's head to Milton for Ms. Sarah from class. If you guys have one for us, come on in. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for today. It was such a great session. Um, my students have two questions. Um, one of the questions is we'd like to know why lemurs have two tongues. No, I'm good. Um, I, we'd like to know why lemurs have two tongues, and we'd like to know if lemurs can be tamed. No, if lemurs can be tamed, the two tongues thing, I'm actually a little curious. So, where did you hear? Where did you hear about that? So, one of our students is quite fascinated with lemurs and knows quite a lot. And he had asked me, "Why do lemurs have two tongues?" Huh? You know, I have to do my own research now. And yeah, it's called the sublingua. And it's like a secondary tongue, and it's unique to 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 these lemurs and other. Um, can I actually share my screen again, or am I still sharing my screen? No, I can bring up your screen. Yeah. No. So so check this out: lemurs and lorises, which is another group of primates that are not monkeys. I have heard of this before. Thank you for bringing this up. They have what's called a tooth comb, 
So they're lower incisors and even the canine, this is not the canine, believe it or not, it's here, are what we call procumbent, meaning they stick out forward like this. And they call it a tooth comb because the lemurs literally use it to kind of scrape through their hair or the hair of their friends when they are grooming each other. And it, here you can kind of see that sublingua, this little white patch underneath the regular tongue. And I guess the thinking is that it helps to kind of clear some of the debris, you know, the grit or whatever, the hair that gets in the tooth comb. That's weird. Thank you for bringing that up. And then, James, can they be tamed? Can they be tamed? No. Um, you know, that's a very common misconception, uh, especially, you know, people see like the ringtail lemur or a mouse lemur and they think it's real cute and cuddly and, you know, they are from a distance. Uh, and I saw some other questions in the chat. Are they aggressive or friendly? They can be extremely aggressive. And in fact, uh, there was a research article that showed that, um, you know, reports of people who had pet lemurs that ended up getting rid of them because they were bitten and scratched so often. <laughs> and, um, they're like any other wild animal. They want to be wild. And, you know, we have them here in captivity in zoos and at the Duke Lemur Center, but we still treat them very much like wild animals because they are, they're not domesticated, you know, dogs and cats, they've had thousands of years of selective breeding to make them tame, but lemurs, we should always keep them wild. I'm really glad we ever get that question. It's something that we touch upon in a lot of our conservation programs in terms of pets for animals, in terms of if you see an animal on someone's shoulder and you're in a foreign country, should you go and pet it? And the answer is almost always no. Uh, these animals are right. wild. It's really important to promote their conservation in wild habitats and make sure that there are opportunities to interact with animals or see them like at the Duke Lemur Center. It's very well regulated. It's very well run. And the staff is dedicated to their protection and, uh, you know, and sort of enhancement in their good life. So great question, guys. All right, unfortunately, we've got time for our two more questions in our live group for our groups on YouTube. I will share ways that you can share any questions afterwards. We're just, we're just having too much fun here. Always great questions. Um, so, Ms. Camarena joining us in Los Angeles. If you have a question for us, if you need that one, come on in. Hi, good morning. Thank you so much for having us. Um, I'm here with my fifth graders virtually uh, due to COVID, but I do have two questions. Ruby, go ahead and ask your question. Uh, how many babies can a mother lemur have? Cool question. So for most lemurs, the answer is one. They only have one baby. And uh, so, for example, the Shifaka, they usually only have one baby, maybe every two to four or five years, in fact, um, because once they have the baby, then they, the baby stays with mom for the first year or two and is really dependent on mom. And it's not until after that that she'll reproduce again. On the other hand, there are the dwarf lemurs and mouse lemurs, which tend to have either uh, twins or with the mouse lemurs, even triplets, and I think more sometimes. Hmm. So mouse lemurs, which are those tiny ones, they can have litters, but then get this, the black and white roughed lemur, which is um, one of the most famous lemurs, you know, if you've been to a zoo, you've probably, and they have lemurs, you've either seen the ringtail or the black and white or red roughed, and they have litters. They're actually quite large to be having litters, but they'll usually have twins or triplets and it's also fascinating because what they do is mothers uh, and like their, their female kin, like their sisters or their uh, cousins, will actually park their infants in little nests that they make and help each other watch them. So, you know, maybe the, the one female will park her offspring and her sister will sit at the nest and watch the babies while she goes out to forage. This is some really cool research from uh, a colleague of mine, Andrea Baden, that um, you know, showed how much they really need that help at the nest. Yeah, very, very cool, James. Well, thank you so much for that. And uh, we'll wrap up with one from Miss Holden joining us in Spruce Grove, Alberta. Miss Holden, come on in. Hi there. We've really enjoyed this today. Preston is wondering how you get so close to the lemurs to get those good pictures of them, especially those the rare shabakas. Yeah. Yeah. Believe it or not, um, you know, the the research team did a great job of getting some of those photos, but it may look like they're close, but some of them are like, you know, 50, 60 feet up in the trees. <laughs> and especially uh, some of the, you know, I mixed in some of um, the photos from my partner, Laura Diara, who's the DLC liaison. And she's given a talk for exploring in the past too. And she's a master photographer. So she's got that giant zoom lens that, you know, it looks like they're right in front of you, but actually they're 100 feet up in the trees. <laughs> 
Very cool question, guys. And if you want to see uh, on that presentation more from Duke Lemur Center, just type it in on our YouTube channel. Every presentation we've ever done with James and his colleagues is all up there. We've also got one coming up next week with Carrie Whitman on fossil lemurs, which is pretty cool. So if you haven't registered for that yet, do so on our website. So again, we've got more questions that we can possibly answer, and that's uh, the best problem to have. But if you guys want to learn more about the work that the Lemur Center is doing, check out rumor.duke.edu or specifically for James' project, the Saba Conservation Program. Amazing stuff there, a lot of good questions. You can also check them out on social media to share your questions there. Uh, James, thank you so, so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. It's always a pleasure, Jesse. It was great to, great to spend some time with you all. I'm always happy to share uh, with uh, the students about Madagascar. Awesome. Well, keep up the amazing work. And for our classes, if you're on those websites, if you want to contribute to the work that James is doing, they do take donations. It really does go a long way in Madagascar to help you protect species, empower communities, and do a lot of real good. So I'd encourage you to do that when you're done, if you have the, the time or inclination. What I want to do now is bring in every one of our classes. So Ms. Foster, Ms. Ayer, Mr. Laveau, Ms. Camarena, Ms. Coleman. Hi. 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 Hi.